Okay, here we go. Good evening and welcome to the fourth lecture of our 18th season, ladies and gentlemen. Please turn off your microphone until the end of the lecture. For those of you who are new to Almont Lectures, let me give you a brief overview. Almont Lectures was established in 2004 by Don Wiles here in Almont. It's a 100% volunteer effort of Mel Turner, Jan Johns, Glenn, Glenda Jones, and myself. We offer seven lectures per season, normally the last Friday of September, October, November, January, February, March, and April. Most lectures run about 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions and comments. Please save your questions and comments until the end of the lecture. Anyone may attend Helmont Lectures, and each lecture is free, but we kindly ask that you consider making a small donation to help pay for our expenses. You can donate online at almontlectures.com or almontlectures.net. Look for the word donate on the right side of the blue banner on your home page. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Chris Riando. You likely know Chris and her partner Rob as folk, the folk who publish our wonderful local newspaper and website, The Hum. Yet Chris also leads a thespian life. Chris first trod the boards of the Almont Old Town Hall in the Valley Players 2001 production of Arsenic and Old Lace. Since then, she has been involved in numerous shows and began directing in 2015. In 2019, she formed Hum Team Productions with her partner, Rob. Tonight, Chris will talk about the stages, pun intended, of community theater in Almont. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to screen share and hope that everything works out with my technology. Is everybody looking at a picture of the Almont Old Town Hall? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. All righty. So welcome everyone, and thanks for tuning in this evening. I'm gonna start with a brief caveat because this talk is not structured as a comprehensive history of community theater in Almont. Although I will be mentioning several individuals and organizations that have been formative over the years. Instead, I would like to start out from a personal perspective and then branch out to the local community and beyond. If you have questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat at any point and I will try to address them at the end of the talk. I'll start a little uh, with a little about my background in the performing arts. Although I'm not a professional, I'm about as gung-ho an amateur as you get. I've been involved with community theater since high school when I helped form the first show choir in Ottawa. We sang, we danced, we sewed our own costumes and did our own choreography. In university, I met my husband and hum partner in crime while playing the part of B.B. Benzenheimer in a chorus line. And at that time, Rob was playing bass in the pit band, looking pretty cool. Uh, so we were at Cast Romance, as it turns out. We moved to Almont in 1989, got married, had two children, and thought that our performing days were behind us. But then Rob found out that the Ragged Flowers needed a bass player, and I auditioned for the Valley Players production of Arsenic and Old Lace and was cast as one of the female leads. For us, those events marked the beginning of a long love affair with the arts in, the air, in this area. Over the years, we came to think of the Almont Old Town Hall as our home away from home, and many of our favorite memories are rooted in that incredible venue. A few highlights include Ian Douglas and Steve Reside's production of Alchemy, a musical, theatrical, and visual arts masterpiece that directly led to the birth of the hum, seeing our two kids performing together in the Valley Players production of Our Town, getting to perform along with our son in Kathy Clark's radio show, staying up to all hours painting a funky backdrop for the Ragged Flowers CD release concert, having to go on at the very last minute in place of one of the lead actors for the final performance of Who Stole Christmas from Mississippi Mills, a show that Rob wrote and I directed and that even my mom was in, which was wonderful, bittersweet recollections of performances and contributions by wonderful people who are no longer with us, 
and countless other memories leading up to and including the final rehearsals for our production of Sketchy Santa right before COVID shut us down this past December. I feel that I should also share the true story that once won an impromptu, what's the weirdest thing you ever saw happen in a community theater production competition? So this was during the rehearsal for one of Fern Martin's shows. There were a bunch of women on stage, along with the Honorable James K. Hugeson, a judge who served on the Federal Court of Canada and just happened to like doing community theater in Almont, where he lives. While we women were delivering our lines, we noticed the resident bat flying around up in the ceiling and chirping rather excitedly. It even swooped near the stage once or twice, causing some concern. When the moment came for Judge Hugeson to give his lines, he stepped forward and began delivering them in this low and resounding voice, which for whatever reason prompted the bat to fly right into his mouth. The judge literally had to spit the bat out and contend with a bunch of screaming co-actors. I don't actually recall what happened to the bat after that, but Judge Hugeson was pretty cool about it. Now, lest you worry that you're going to hear more about bats and mouths, I'm actually going to move on to the moment uh, that I realized why community theater was so important to me. Ironically, it occurred in the Ron Caron Auditorium during a workshop on core gifts that my friend Jeff Mills had encouraged me to attend. In my nutshell, here's what I took away from that. Gifts are not the same as skills. You can be quite skilled at something, either innately or through lots of practice, but it can still be draining for you to exercise that skill. I thought back to the years that I used to teach high school, which were some of the most exhausting of my life, even though I felt I was pretty good at it. When you use your gifts, you are likely to feel that your batteries are charging up rather than depleting. If you overuse a gift, you can still get tired, but essentially the sharing of your gift with others is energizing and rewarding. This is from the coregift.org website. Your core gift is a unique offering that you have to share with others. It is connected to and strengthened by your life experiences, particularly your challenges. Knowing your core gift means you can better share it with others, provides focus to your sense of purpose and well being, and guides your decision making on your path forward. It develops throughout your lifetime, touches all parts of your life, and becomes more impactful each time you face new challenges or give your core gift in service to others. We spent that one day workshop trying to determine our core gift. And after several hours of listening, participating in exercises and talking with other participants, I felt that I had successfully identified mine. I can't recall the exact wording I ended up with, but it had to do with helping others to identify and share their gifts with the wider community. I do remember realizing like an epiphany that directing community theater productions was the perfect way for me to use my gift. For me, community theater is like a team sport where there are no opponents or losing teams. A group coalesces, each member contributing their skills, time, and talent to a common goal. In a healthy group, they support and encourage each other, take risks, make mistakes, learn and grow, and ultimately build something bigger than the sum of its parts. With a little luck, people develop or learn to access skills they didn't even realize they had. And that's where the real magic of amateur theater shines through. And it's not just the onstage hams and extroverts who find a place. People can contribute their gifts in myriad ways, including, but not restricted to, being on stage, acting, singing, dancing, being funny or goofy, all of the above. Being backstage where you find organizational and detail-oriented people like producers, those who prefer herding cats and staying calm in crises like stage managers, and in some cases, even people who can teach kids to knit and play poker in order to keep them quiet backstage during performances. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. And then there's the creative team, including costume designers. The ones you're looking at here were designed and created by Ingrid Hamster. Hair, makeup, set, lighting, sound, graphic design of posters, musicians, writing of scripts, the list goes on. Sometimes people find or develop gifts or skills in community theater that end up affecting the course of their lives and careers. Some of you may recognize the name Jeff Semple. Jeff appeared in several Valley Players productions as a youth growing up in Almont and was also a regular student of Jennifer Lola's drama classes. 
Jeff is now a senior correspondent and video journalist with Global National News based in Toronto. He has reported from more than 30 countries across five continents covering terrorist attacks in Europe, the refugee crisis in the Middle East, and the Olympic Games in Russia, Brazil, and South Korea. Jeff's reports have appeared on the BBC, CNN, Sky News, NPR, and ABC, and have garnered awards and been recognized by the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, the Radio Television Digital News Association, and the Canadian Medical Association, among others. On the left in this slide is Josie Goyer, who was another student of Jennifer Lola's. Josie was heard for years on the, on the Ottawa radio station Hot 89.9, where she was a DJ, host, and program director. On the right is Claire Hunter. I remember Claire's amazing singing and acting from her years at Elmont District High School, and also from the time just a few years ago when she returned to town with her band to play the Focus Concert Series. Jordan McIntosh was a regular on the Mississippi Mud stage in Carlton Place, and also appeared in Fern Martin's Quilts from Hell, Here's Jordan in an image from his single Grew Up in a Country Song off of his album Steal My Heart. And here is a somewhat younger Jordan on the far left in a promotional photo from the Muds production of Alice in Wonderland. And then on the right, making that awesome face in the poster from Quilts from Hell. I'm sure there are many more similar stories. These are just a few that I am familiar with. It is inspiring to see people, to see young people get involved with local theater and discover talents that point their lives or careers in a specific direction. But in addition to acting as an incubator and launching pad, community theater can also be a magnet that attracts skilled, mature folks. When the crew of Sketchy Santa got together for the first time, we were absolutely blown away by the depth and breadth of experience in the room. There were people who had trained in professional theater, who had run their own theater companies, who had won awards for costumes they created for professional productions in New York City. And there they were in a room together, willing to help Hum Team Productions put on a zany Christmas show in Almont. But my experience of meeting ridiculously talented people masquerading as regular Mississippi millions started long before we created Hum Team Productions. In fact, I can con confidently say that Hum Team would never have come into being were it not for the contributions of and opportunities provided by Noreen Young, Fern Martin, Catherine Clark, Ron Caron, and others of their ilk. I had the great fortune of being cast in the production of Les Belles Sur that Catherine Clark direct directed back in uh, 2008 under the auspices of the Valley Players. This slide suggests that I may have been cast because I have a really big mouth, but I don't think that was the only reason. At any rate, Catherine Clark looks and sounds like a regular person until you see her acting or directing. When I found out that she had been, she had studied theater at the University of Alberta, I was not surprised. Catherine actually has this amazing clipping from an old newspaper showing her appearing as Juliet opposite Paul Gross as Romeo. Paul later went on to star in shows like Due South, Men with Brooms, and most recently Alias Grace, among others. And Kathy eventually brought her considerable skills to Almont. Cup of tea. I can't recall exactly when I first encountered Noreen Young, but I will never forget the experience of meeting her. Within a few minutes, she sussed out my pension for volunteering and offered me the first of many opportunities to assist her in bringing something creative to the community. Even though she had decades of professional experience, experience and I was just starting out in an amateur capacity, she made me feel like my contributions were welcome and important. Noreen has a real knack for identifying people's gifts and putting them to use. And she has mentored countless performers, puppeteers, and community enthusiasts like me. Now that I've told you about young folks who have discovered their gifts in small town community theater and taken them out into the world, as well as some older folks who developed their skills elsewhere and brought them here to us, I've got a lovely full circle story to share. One of the many Almont talents that Noreen helped to nurture was a young man by the name of Joey Graff. He's the one with the distinctive curly red hair in this slide, playing the part of Kinnicky in Greece. 
I first became aware of Joey's talent when he performed the part of the voracious plant Audrey II in Almont and District High School's production of Little Shop of Horrors. With assistance from Noreen and from ADHS's brilliant drama club director, Jenny Sheffield, Joey built and voiced multiple iterations of Audrey from small potted plant to giant man eater. His performance was just amazing. As I was preparing this talk, I reached out to Joey and asked him to comment on how his early experiences in community theater helped shape his career path. This is what Joey had to say. Theater in one form or another has been a part of me throughout my entire life. Though it's not always been my calling or vocation, it has never left, nor do I think it ever will. The annual musical at Elmont United Church, attending productions of the Valley Players, learning to create and manipulate puppets from Noreen Young, and the yearly high school production were all cornerstones of my life growing up in Almont. The community was rich with opportunity to participate in the act of theater. These foundations led me to pursue the arts long after high school. This was not always the case. I had been a student who had his sights set on the sciences. Choosing to explore a career in theater felt like a natural progression when I finally arrived at the decision. There were many lessons I learned that have shaped me as a person, the value of hard work, the necessity of the creative spirit, and the indelible strength found in community, to name a few. In choosing to pursue the arts, I have had the fortune to travel across the country, perform hundreds of times in beloved shows, and further expand my abilities as a creative and storyteller. I have met incredible teachers and worked alongside amazing souls. Along this path, I have discovered a love of theater and storytelling as a craft that I will continue to nurture and grow. Without the community I grew up in and the experiences of my youth, I would have none of this. That is life I cannot imagine. And in this slide, Joey is appearing as Trekkie Monster in a Toronto production of Avenue Q, which was the, one of the first shows he did professionally. He eventually got to hit the milestone of 100 performances with it. And here's Joey again on the far right, this time as Dorothy in Thank You for Being a Friend on the national tour of the Golden Girls musical. And that full circle story I promised, Joey Graff is currently directing the upcoming production of The Hound of the Basketballs, a show written by Alan Martin that will be performed at the Almont Old Town Hall this spring as a fundraiser for the Puppets Up Festival. So I'm going to move away from the stories about individuals for a bit, although you will hear more about a few key players later on. Right now, I wanna take a brief look back at the modern history of community theater in Mississippi Mills starting with the original players, the Valley Players of Almont. From their website, the Valley Players was founded by Roger and Ruth Marshall in 1983. They brought together a few interested people to do some play readings with the intent of eventually starting a drama group. The reading group continued to read plays for several months while discussions continued on the practical aspects of producing plays. Later in 1983, a one-act play titled The Trysting Place was presented free to a senior's residence. It was directed by Ruth Marshall and produced by Ingrid Hamster. From that first production, the Valley Players continued to reach out to its audiences and its community with the same enthusiasm, producing up to three shows a year until 2013. After that, they continued to assist in producing and funding other productions, a practice that continues to this day. Brian McManus, who was one of the initial directors named in the Valley Players charity application, sent along his recollections. Brian says that the group formed in Roger and Ruth Marshall's living room and was named the Valley Players, beating the contender Old Mill Town Players. The Old Town Hall was not in use at the time, and we could build sets there. We then carried the pieces down the fire escape to resurrect the set in the high school gym. And here Brian adds that, quote, nobody died. 10 or 12 years later, we were enjoying a heyday, selling out shows like Lend Me a Tenor and Steel Magnolias. Selling 1,200 tickets in a town of 3,600 was pretty good. Other arts organizations would have been happy to do as well. The players worked hard with the Arts Council to restore and renovate the Almont Old Town Hall, donating tens of thousands of dollars to the effort. The elevator alone cost over $200,000. Over the years, the group was a place to go for many to find community. There was a core group, but there was always a new contingent. 
people going through a change of life or family issue or some other stress would show up for a year or two, make some friends, have some fun and recharge their batteries and move on. In addition to the town hall effort, the players would usually donate to a local charity and send a check to graduating students from the local high school. Brian adds that in our final years, we entered into an Eastern Ontario Drama League competition and won two awards, a reflection of the quality we had been offering for a long time. One member of the Valley Players was particularly involved in the transformation of the Almont Old Town Hall from a former council chamber turned storage area into its current iteration as a renowned performing arts venue. If you have visited the Ron Caron Auditorium since it was renamed in his honor, you probably know who I am referring to. Ron Caron volunteered tirelessly behind the scenes of everything theatrical taking place in Mississippi Mills, the Old Town Hall, the Valley Players, the Noreen Young Bursary, and Puppets Up, to name but a few. When we had our home headquarters in the old post office, we used to see Ron about three times a week when he came in to climb up to the clock tower at the very top of the building to wind the town clock, which he had restored to working order. He was truly a town treasure. And I am lucky to say that he gave me a hug almost every time I saw him. Uh, one of my last and most poignant memories of Ron is from shortly after he was diagnosed with cancer. At that time, he was in the process of designing and building an elaborate set for the production of a Mississippi Mills Christmas Carol that was a fundraiser for Puppets Up. You can see a portion of the set in this slide, which also includes Ron's puppet in the lower right side. I remember that Ron was growing annoyed and impatient with his doctors because they couldn't seem to grasp that he needed them to make him better so that he could fulfill his volunteer commitments to that show. Ultimately, he did finish the set, but he was unable to see the show in person because he wasn't well enough. His memorial service held in the Ron Caron Auditorium was standing room only. Ron Caron and the Valley Players literally set the stage for other community theater groups and endeavors that followed in ensuing years. I apologize if I have missed or forgotten any, but here are some highlights from my memory and the HUMS archives. Around 2003, a group called the Alma Social Action Players, ASAP for short, came together to put on a production of the Vagina Monologues, followed by a play by Almont resident Sophie Tamas entitled The Everyday Impossible. Some members of ASAP are pictured here. Then for several years, Natalie Millett, who was also very active in the Valley Players, wrote a series of local ghost stories. These were put on around Halloween on the grounds of the Millet can tale. They not only raised money for that property, they also introduced people to local historical figures such as Ethel McKenzie, the wife of R. Tate McKenzie. In my opinion, the productions written by local talents like Sophie Tamas and Natalie Millett ushered in a new stage of community theater in Almont. They showcased stories and issues of importance to the community and showed people that locally written theater could be just as good or better than bedroom farces or other traditional fare. In the late 2000s, a new local playwright emerged on the Almont scene. This was someone who was born and raised in this area and who then raised her own family here while diving into social justice issues, helping to found local institutions like the Hub and Lanark County Interval House. In my response, in response to my emailed question, Fern Martin writes, I have always written songs to celebrate friends and family birthdays using familiar tunes and wrote many little skits for the Hub, the Pakenham Curling Club and Interval House. I retired from Interval House in 20, uh, 2005. Now I had more time. In 2009, I wrote a longer one hour play to celebrate the Hub's 35th birthday called The Phantom of the Hubra. And just note, this slide is actually from the 2019 remount of Phantom in which Fern played the fairy godmother and Ed Lawrence played the Phantom. Fern continues. In 2010, I was excited to write my first full length musical play, Quilts from Hell. I loved doing the research and finding so many quilts that had character names like Sunbonnet Sue and Drunkard's Path. I especially loved the interest and support from many quilters who made it their business to find the needed quilts. And then the keenness of the actors, musicians, director, costume designer and all to make it happen. It was quite thrilling, I was hooked. 
Doing the research for each play has been hugely satisfying. Many of them have been historical. So learning about James Naismith and Tate and Kenzie, and then the history of Pakenham, all with the help of my sister Marilyn Sneddon and many, many others. The surprises have been a special treat. Actors with ideas of how to improve a scene, musicians showing up in Blues Brothers attire, the incredible imagination of the costume designers and the poster designer, the efforts of the prop people, and of course, the dynamic direction of the directors. Then there are the nights of the shows, watching the performers excel and feeling the audience reaction, laughter in all the right places, comments about how much they learned, how much they enjoyed it. I feel blessed to be surrounded by very keen and talented people willing to do whatever it takes to get her done. Thanks for, for those lovely words. And in, your, in case you're wondering, those are in fact dancing beluga whales on the slide surrounded, surrounding Mighty Mount Packingham. But naturally you probably figured that out. That's an easy one. Um, Ferns Productions have also raised significant amounts of money for important local causes. Mary Lou Souter from the Library Board recalls that upwards of $10,000 was raised for the Packenham Library for performances of A Peak at Packenham. A significant portion of that was put towards the creation of the garden in front of the new library building. Mary Lou adds that the space was chosen as a living memorial because of Fern's dedication to public gardens. And by the way, the young people in this slide were the very ones who were taught to knit and play poker backstage. They had a lot of energy. And speaking of young people, I want to focus for a minute on the productions put on by the Almonton District High School Drama Club under the direction of Jenny Sheffield. When my own kids went to ADHS, they were not really into team sports or other extracurriculars, but they both instantly gravitated to Jenny's productions. When my son was in grade nine, he was invited to play lead keyboards in the production of Little Shop of Horrors, the same one that Joey Graff was involved in. When my daughter got there, she was asked to choreograph the production of Grease I mentioned earlier. They were also both in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which to this day remains one of my favorite productions of that play. Those experiences were absolutely formative to my kids, and I am sure to many others who have attended over the years. One of the neatest things Jenny Sheffield did was to badger the organizers of the Cappies into admitting ADHS into their competition. Launched by the Ottawa Citizen as part of the Critics and Award Program, Cappies are yearly awards chosen by student critics and given to student productions in the Ottawa Carleton District School Board. Now, Almont is in the Upper Canada District School Board. Presentations take place at the prestigious Cappies Gala at the NAC, which is where this photo of the ADHS crew was taken in 2019. ADHS was not competing in the Cappies back when my kids and Joey Graff were attending the school, but since they, have, since they were admitted to the program, they have walked away with honors such as best play bet, and best lead actor, and they have been nominated in numerous categories. This is from a school with a population of less than 400, competing against every high school in the National Capital District. Jenny's choice of shows is bold and ambitious, bringing productions like The Curious Incident of the Dog of the Nighttime to the Almont Old Town Hall stage. Needless to say, you should never miss one of their productions. Another example of cutting edge theater taking place in this area was the Climate Change Theater presentation coordinated in 2019 by Emily Perlman. This slide shows the cast from one of the short plays entitled Trump Tannic. Emily is another one of those, I can't believe they wound up in Almont cases. And she used her considerable talents and her experience gleaned from running her own Mikasa Theater to organize two sold out evenings of theater about the climate. That initiative raised $2,300 for local environmental causes, including $1,000 for the Almont Tree Planting Committee and $1,300 towards the work done by Climate Network Lanark. When we finally put this pandemic behind us, please keep an eye out for Emily's next endeavors. And before I move on, I just wanna remind you about The Hound of the Basketballs, written by Alan Martin and directed by Joey Graff, which is going up at the Almont Old Town Hall from May 12th to 15th of this year. This photo is actually from the 2017 production of It's a Wonderful Mississippi Mills Life because we don't yet have any promotional images from the Hound yet. But if you keep an eye on the Hum and the Puppets Up website, you start to see some soon. 
Now I'm going to return to a personal perspective and tell you a bit about how I began directing and how Hum Team Productions got off the ground. It was opportunities provided me by Noreen Young and Fern Martin that prompted me to begin directing, which turns out to be my core gift and one of the most rewarding things I have ever done. I had acted in a few Fern productions and then Fern asked me to direct Trash Dance in the spring of 2015 which gave me the experience and confidence I needed to take on other of her creations, such as A Peak at Pakenham and Phantom of the Hubbera. In the fall of 2015, Noreen Young asked me to direct a Mississippi Mills Christmas Carol for Puppets Up, a production that involved both amateur and professional actors and puppeteers. <clears throat> Directing a Mississippi Mills Christmas Carol led to my being asked to direct Sleeping Rough, a tragic puppet opera by composer Roddy Elias featuring puppets by Noreen and puppeteering by Noreen, Stephen Brathwaite and Bob Stutt from Under the Umbrella Tree, as well as Sarah Argue from Rock the Arts, another one of Noreen's protégés. That production took me to Arts Court and the GCTC and even got me paid. But more importantly, it dramatically increased my confidence in my ability to both direct and project manage a full length theatrical production. My experiences with those shows, all of which were written by people from Almont or Ottawa, also helped me realize that I prefer to direct a project that has some kind of connection to this area. I also enjoy working with a script that is somewhat fluid because for me, one of the best parts of directing is the collaboration between playwright, director, and cast. The other great thing about using a homegrown script is that you don't have to pay royalties. They say that necessity is the mother of invention, but in the case of Hum Team Productions, it's more like the wife. With Puppets Up winding down uh, back in 2016 and Fern moving to Victoria, my husband Rob soon realized that he had an underdeployed director on his hands, not a good scenario. Fortunately for both of us, he was able to somehow sit down and write a script, his first, for a full length musical play called Who Stole Christmas from Mississippi Mills. And here's where our story gets kind of magical. We started talking to people about the project and within a few months had assembled a dream team of actors, musicians, puppeteers, costume makers, stage managers and crew, makeup and hair artists, promotion people and more. Some of these were professionals. Among others, we had Mike McCormick from The Arrogant Worms agree to be our Grinch, we pulled in most of this area's professional puppeteers. We cast CBC's Ed Lawrence as basically himself. Ingrid Hamster outdid herself creating the costumes. Our makeup and hair leads were well known for their work for our other troops, as well as at Saunders Farm. And our publicity was knocked out of the park by Alan Stanley and Eileen Henneman. All of these people were taking a chance on the first production by a fledgling company. These professionals certainly elevated our show and helped us look and sound our very best, but just as important were the contributions of the amateurs of whom Rob and I were too. When you define amateur as someone who loves from the Latin amateur, you discover that people can completely surprise you with hidden talents, dedication, and willingness to take risks, which can result in unexpected delights. Ed Lawrence has called this a willingness to be fools for the divine, which I think is a particularly apt descri description. I have witnessed moments during amateur productions that have just taken my breath away, and they seem to occur when someone discovers something about themselves or their abilities that they didn't previously know. This in the moment discovery can't be faked, and I believe it is one of the great mysteries and delights of amateur theater. And it makes the audience think, I want what they're having. Helen Antibi, who is shown on the right in this slide, moved to Almont in 2019 and immediately appeared that year in both the remount of Phantom of the Habra and in Who Stole Christmas from Mississippi Mills. I asked Helen if she would share her thoughts about how community theater can act as an introduction to the wider community. Here's what Helen had to say. Theater is about making yourself vulnerable, even more so when you, don't, when you know nobody in the group. It is a great space to show up as a newcomer to easily learn about the community, its members, its history and rich fabric. 
Theater attracts people who have a love of arts and culture, and those people are often longstanding community supporters and contributors with vast and deep knowledge of what makes the community tick along. They tend to have a strong connection to each other's lives and what is needed to support each other and the community at large. Theater people tend to be courageous, warm, funny, and creative. This makes for a warm, welcoming micro community that holds much power and love. Experiencing just a bit of that energy makes you feel part of something meaningful and valuable, a sense of belonging. Community theater is a much needed place for creative expression and con creative connection in the community. Being a part of Phantom of the Habra was a lovely introduction to Almont. It was made possible because Chris and Fern took a chance on me. They did not know anything about me. This is how courage changes lives. They changed the course of my life as an amateur actress, my life in Almont, and the course of the show. I felt honored to be included so early in my journey in Almont. That's her in the middle, by the way. <laughs> I gained intimate knowledge of the people and the local stories and learned of the overwhelming love for the town. The friendships I made helped me to feel like I fit in. The recognition of my contribution brought so many smiles to my face. People would wave to me on the street and say hello using my name. They had been audience members of whom I had no knowledge, but they knew me. I felt part of something important, especially since we were fundraising for a local cause that was close to everyone's heart. Doing a second show, Who Stole Christmas from Mississippi Mills, allowed me to deepen the relationships I had made and further practice my acting skills. It was another journey with many laughs with a great group of people who embraced the challenge and stop at nothing to pull off a great show. The teamwork was a beautiful thing to experience. The shows were conceived of and directed from the heart, so it is no surprise that these, those shows were all about love. Love stories, love for community, love of drama, and love for each other's creative talents. They reconnect us with human spirit. I cannot think of a better way to become part of a community. So now that you've heard all of the reasons why I and a few other people think community theater is important, I do have a bit of a pitch for you. You may have noticed that these past two years have been pretty tough on performers, both professionals and amateurs. You may have heard that Hum Team Productions was only two nights away from the opening night of our Christmas show this past December when we were forced to postpone all performances due to Omicron. But even without having to contend with COVID, there are other factors that are key to keeping community theater alive and kicking. You can quote me on this one. One is the willingness of audiences to take risks. Back in the day, it was considered pretty risky to perform the vagina monologues in the Valley or for Catherine Clark to put on Les Belles Sur. Michelle Tremblay's script is certainly darker and more challenging than anything Norm Foster has turned out. But Kathy poured her heart and soul into that production and we ended up selling out almost every seat and amazing our audiences. Jenny Sheffield's recent production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, the one that won ADHS at Cappy for Best Lead Actor, was of a caliber that is rarely seen on any stage, never mind one inhabited by a group of high school students. I would say that if someone is passionate about a production or has written their own script, take a chance. You just may be amazed. Another factor is access to volunteers. Um, on stage and backstage, they can make or break a community production. If you have a hidden gift or talent or want to discover one, try volunteering for a troupe in this area. And finally, access to a good venue is absolutely key. Back in their heyday, the Valley Players had almost unlimited access to the Old Town Hall, primarily because they were the ones rehabilitating it and using it. But now other arts groups need to book it, and the town needs to recoup some of the cost of maintaining that beautiful space. However, as the auditorium is increasingly booked for things like yoga and weddings, and as the spaces previously available as green rooms and dressing rooms become scarce, community theater productions are finding it increasingly challenging to access the space they need at an affordable price. If you want to put on a full-scale production in Almont with sound, lights, and a decent audience capacity, this how really is the only game in town. Last fall, Rob and I had the opportunity to bring one of his short plays to the Canada Theater. That building is astounding, comprising a rehearsal space and a giant workshop in addition to the theater itself. 
it came about as the results of loads of community support and input and some really great grant writers. Until we can create a similar space in Almont, I would argue that prioritizing the Ron Caron Auditorium for use as a performance space is our best and possibly only option. If anyone is interested in creating the Friends of the Ron Caron Auditorium, please send me an email. Seriously, send me an email. There's my email address. <laughs> That's about all I have to say for tonight, although I could go on almost indefinitely about my passion for community theater. I would like to thank the organizers of the Almont Lectures for asking me to give this talk and to thank all of you for attending and for supporting the Almont Lectures. If you have any questions, I would be happy to try to address them. And am I on? Yes. <laughs> okay, Chris, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Very exciting. Love your enthusiasm. <laughs> Are you up for some questions and comments? Absolutely. We'll uh, wait to see if someone raises their hand or speaks up. Oh, I see Ingrid's hand up. Ingrid. Oh, oh, sorry, you need uh, to turn your microphone. You're muted, yeah. <laughs> okay, Chris, you've moved me to tears. Very well done. Thank you so much. You are such an inspiration to the community. Um, you've outdone yourself and uh, you, you, you pull the community together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm just one in a long line. <laughs> but thank, thank you, Ingrid, that's lovely. That's lovely. I, it was it, it was daunting almost to uh, to try to remember everything and, and to pull, you know, pull everything back. And, and the, the HUM archives are only really accessible back to 2006. So I had trouble going earlier than that. But uh, people were very helpful in, in terms of sharing some of the you know, information about the Valley players and, and others, which was which was really great. Um, I imagine you all probably all want to know when uh, Sketchy Santa's coming back, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, tell us. <laughs> We've optimistically booked the town hall for November of this year. <laughs> um, so we are very much, yeah, we, we were originally hoping that we could do it sooner. Um, but the trick is if we do it too soon, then we are still contending with Omicron and could be shut down again. And then you get into spring and summer, there's that other fundraiser, the Hound of the Basketballs. I don't didn't want to compete with that at all because we're both raising money for Puppets Up. And then everybody's schedule gets crazy. And, and so, yeah, it's it's looking like it's going to be, be November. And, uh, you know, please keep an eye out and, and uh, come out again. <laughs> um, uh, where does one learn about addition? That's a really good question. Um, uh, so some shows, some troops do open auditions, the Mississippi Muds, uh, the, the stu Studio Theater Perth. Um, I, yeah, we, we, we put them in the hum wherever we, <laughs> thanks Rona, <laughs> we, we put them in the hum where, whenever they, they're made available to us. Um, with Sketchy Santa, we didn't hold auditions, although we have with earlier shows, because we started workshopping those as individual sketches um, using, you know, the people who were available on Zoom and stuff. That 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 show came out uh, strangely through COVID, and so we didn't actually have auditions for that. But um, like, for example, the Phantom of the Hubra that was that was in the hum, and uh, you know, probably on Facebook, and that's how Helen Antoby managed to get involved with the community within the first week of moving to Almont. So, yeah. And do I do I see Fern Martin? Hi, Chris. That was great. Absolutely. Um, I had this idea, which I never shared with anybody, but I've often thought of those schools in the summertime are, their gyms are vacant, I think. Maybe there's cleaning going on. And I always thought at Naismith School, what we could do would be to move a log building, have it near the school. You could yeah. rehearse there and, and then you could just move over to the gymnasium and have a better, bigger rehearsal and then eventually go to the town hall so that you wouldn't be using the town hall all the time for rehearsals, which is expensive. 
um, it would be also nice to have another grand piano in there too. That was, now that I think about it, that's another asset for the town. Absolutely. Huge yeah. asset. Um, but anyway, I just wonder whether those facilities are available in the summer. Yeah, that's a good question. I know COVID has sent everything, you know, everybody's scrambling for, you know, cleaning protocols and blah, blah, blah. But maybe, maybe once, once things have calmed down, because it really is tricky to, um, to find both rehearsal space and, and then to afford the town hall, because you need to rehearse a little bit in the town hall. Um, and, and also, if you're doing a show with any kind of complicated set, um, you often need to be in weeks in advance building and, and, and getting your set set up. So our shows have had very flexible sets, um, easily movable sets uh, for just that reason is so that we can come in late in the game. <laughs> Rona's not sure if they're so easily movable, but yeah. Um, um, aw, thanks, Glenda. <laughs> I, I, I practiced this talk twice today and once yesterday, and every single time I teared up when I talked about Ron Caron. He was just, he was just one in a million, man, that guy. But we have so many one in a million people in Almont contributing, you know, in Almont and the area contributing their, their skills or gifts. Uh, it's pretty astounding. We're, we're very lucky. And burn again. I would just like to say too, I have two scripts, um, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one which uh, I wrote, uh, it's about a war between uh, perennials and cannabis. And, uh, you know, of course, COVID killed that. And um, I've written, I wrote another one years ago about Interval House and, uh, and it was sleeping with my back to the wall, but that's never happened either. So, you know, I'd like to come back. I think you should. I think we need you. <laughs> <laughs> there's hardly Actually, approval in the audience. Um, there's a fellow who I believe is on is on the Zoom who who sent me some a synopsis for four plays that he's written. And uh, I, I'm really excited to read them. There's Bud. Hi. <laughs> That I, I, yeah, I, I really would like to read some of those plays because they sound amazing. Um, and like I said, homegrown is the best way to go um, around here anyway. Uh, it, it's just, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've never been disappointed um, when either somebody has either written something or as I say, is very passionate about, about something. Um, so, um, okay. Lo lo loads of lovely uh, um, kudos and, and comments. Does anybody, I would be happy to answer a question. Oh, it looks like Nikki has a question. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Chris, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, what are your hopes for the future of theater in Mississippi Mills? I would like to see, I would like to see more people making theater and more people supporting those endeavors. So for example, as far as I know, the Valley Players as an organization still exists. Um, and there is a small group that sort of um, are, are looking after the books and filing taxes or whatever. Uh, so that's an organization that could come back to life if there was enough interest locally. Um, but then there's also, you know, I, I'd love to see Emily come back and do, you know, do another um, production of some sort. Um, I also, I also think that that it's really important to have opportunities for young people. Um, there was another organization that was almost as old as the Valley Players. I believe they started in 86 or 87. It was called On Stage for Kids. And they put on about four shows a year, um, generally in, in one of the uh, public schools. And it was a really low cost, easy access um, point of entry for, for young kids to go and see a performance. And they, sometimes it was magic. Sometimes it was, you know, it was usually goofy and kids, it could have been musical or whatever, but, but that, that helped build um, an interest in young children and being an audience and going to see performances. Um, Puppets Up does a similar thing. And I'm really delighted that, that hopefully it'll come back this summer and if not this summer, the next summer, but I think, I think it's looking, things are looking a little bit better um, 
I don't know. I don't know. I, I just had to shut down a show last month, a month and a half ago, so it still stings a bit, but uh, we thought we were ahead of the curve and we, we weren't, but uh, yeah. Um, I just, I think that I, and I'd love to see, I'd love to see other spaces become available to for use as a rehearsal space. I'd like to see, uh, I, I honestly, I, I think that a Friends of the El Monto Town Hall or the Ron Caron Auditorium could hold fundraisers that could raise money so that a, a new production company or somebody who's taking a chance could have a, a little bit of help getting into the, the old town hall because it is a, an amazing performance space. Um, I, I got a little bit political there when I was talking about yoga and weddings because there are lots of yoga studios, there are a lot of wedding venues, there's only one Almont Old Town Hall, only one performing arts space that 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 really that with the sound and the lights and the stage and everything in Almont and uh, you know I would love to see it be made more accessible to groups who want to put on performances of any any stripe there so I'm willing to bake cookies I don't know. <laughs> Oh, I'm also I've also decided I'm I, I apparently I'm giving I'm, I'm being given a, a modest honorarium for this talk and I'm going to donate it to Jenny Sheffield's next production. And please, please, if you take one thing away from this, don't miss Jenny Sheffield's Almont District High School. I should she'll, she'd be embarrassed if I called them her productions. She always directs them. She makes them happen. Her, the students are amazing. I just don't understand how she gets performances like that out of high school kids. And it, it's just not to be missed. So. Anyway, uh, uh, could have pre-sale tickets for some of the pre-show expenses? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, with with uh, with Sketchy Santa, it was a Hum Team Productions uh, production. I'll get you to you next year. I see your hand waving there. Um, so we, uh, you know, like we put our ads in our own paper and we did did the work because we love doing stuff like that. Uh, and actually, when we had to close it down, enough people uh, refused the refund of their ticket that we were able to pay our out-of-pocket expenses, which mostly were rental of the town hall. Um, and uh, so that was very gen generous of the of the community. Um, but yeah, I suppose you could pre-sell tickets. Uh, it's just tricky if you don't get to put on your show. Um, and these days, that's still a little a little bit dicey. I'm going to go to Ian Douglas now and then have a look at this. Great. Thank you, uh, Chris. Wonderful talk. Um, very inspiring. And I, you're, I totally agree with your comments about Jenny Sheffield. That's, that's some kind of a miracle that has had such an impact on so many um, kids, you know, in their formative years. So, yeah, I don't know how she does it either. But the same impact is on, on the community players and the, and the productions that you mentioned tonight. Um, I had a question for you as a director. How yes. does it feel when a show is over? I, I was curious about kind of the emotional arc of a production from start to finish. What's That's that like? A great question. Um, uh, uh, the, the emotional arc, it's sort of like having a child. Um, <laughs> at, the beginning, at the beginning, they're small and helpless and you have to do everything for them. Yeah. And, and you do all the talking and you do all the telling them where to go and you know, whatever. And uh, then they start to mature and, and, and the director's job is to, is to back away and empower the cast and the crew yeah. Yeah. to do what they do best and, to, to, and then to start leaning on each other and, and relying on each other. And yeah. to the point where when I'm sitting at the back of the hall during a performance, it's like seeing your kid walk across and get their diploma or whatever, yeah. you know. You know? Um, but after the uh, after the show is over, I always get really sick. So <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't have to think about anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I did get COVID after this last one. We didn't even get to put the show on. Um, yeah. But now I feel like I've had it. So, you know, maybe next time I won't get it. <laughs> who knows yeah anyway, no, that, uh, that's a great analogy so it's kind of like parenting and then hopefully the kids eventually just sort of fly out of the nest and uh, uh but do you feel sad when it's all over do you feel like a vacuum in your life or oh yeah yeah and rob rob's good because he'll just start talking about the next thing to, to get <laughs> right. me out of it out of the fun. Look, I wrote another, uh, wrote another sketch. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks so much. I think Thank Ingrid you. has her, her hand up too. Oh, 
Okay. Well, just to, to add to, um, to the answer uh, for Chris, if I may, Ian, there's nothing like a good after party. <laughs> Very important. Perfect. Very important. Very important. Very important. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to comment on Glenda Jones's uh, note in chat, which is the Sage Age Theater. And I, I'm sorry I didn't mention them. I didn't. I don't. I didn't have a strong personal connection to them, although we had put some things on the hum over the years. Um, but yeah, they were they were amazing. They went strong for many many years. Um, and I also want to add that that in our in our hum team productions, we've had you know we've had cast members over eighty. Um, years of age, and certainly many in their 50 to 79 range, because <laughs> uh, that's my demographic. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's great to see seniors getting involved, and and uh, yeah, we and one of the most one of the I'll just share a little uh, a little heartwarming uh, story, which is that um, when we had to shut down Sketchy Sound, that was one of the worst days most heartbreaking days of my life. Um, I, I got a message either that day or the, or the day after from one of our cast members who is uh, who had lost her husband. He had died earlier this year. And she said that being part of that cast for the last four months had really helped her with that. And you know, through the grieving, pro grieving process, she'd gotten hugs, she'd gotten support. And so for me, that made it all worthwhile just right just that little amount doesn't matter that we didn't get to go on stage um that's what it's all about is is that kind of support and and building a caring supportive community so yeah um yeah, yeah. we have time for maybe one or two more questions or comments any hands going up I don't see any been lovely to see everyone's smiling faces while I was chatting away there. Yeah. Okay. So do I get to give my parting words? Sounds good. So thank you again, Chris, for a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, certainly inspiring. I want also to thank uh, Mel Turner, Jan Johns, and Glenda Jones for helping me put uh, this lecture series together and always being there when I need them, which is often. Uh, certainly, I want to thank all of you, the audience, for uh, preferring to see this than Netflix. Uh, I, I should say that our next lecture will be the 25th of February, uh, the last Friday of February at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, and for that one, we have something completely different. Um, one of my uh, dear friends, Johanna Philp Henke, who resides outside of Sacramento, California, has spent much of her life trying to improve the lives of children in Chile, her home country. Uh, so she's going to talk a bit about some of the research she's done there, uh, which was sometimes especially difficult under the Pinochet dictatorship. Uh, so she'll be talking about that. Her uh, lecture title is Too Many Children and Families Left Behind. And then we'll have two others beyond that. Hope you can attend all of them. Thank you again for uh, coming tonight. It's, it's been a slice. It's been great. Okay. So let's go home and have a glass of wine. Oh, you are home. <laughs> <laughs>